Tijd om professor Dr. Richard Davidson bij u aan te kondigen. In 2006 he was mentioned in Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Well, that's quite something for a psychiatrist, I think. He is managing director of the Weisman uh, Laboratorium for Brain Imaging and Behavior and the Laboratory for Effective uh, Neuroscience and many, many, many other things. He received many awards for outstanding uh, research and the title of his speech here today is Well-being is a Skill. May I invite you? So thank you all very much for uh, being here today, and thank you to Siron for uh, hosting this event. And yesterday, I had the opportunity to visit uh, the Siron headquarters here and uh, was just really inspired by uh, all that is being accomplished. And uh, there is nothing like this that I know of in the United States, uh, and it's wonderful to see uh, such an integrated approach to healthcare uh, being deployed here in the Netherlands. Uh, today, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about some research which I think uh, provides some basis for uh, many of the activities that we saw going on yesterday. Uh, I am a psychologist and a neuroscientist by training, and since the beginning of my career, I've been captivated by the question of why is it that certain people are vulnerable in response to adversity and other people are resilient? And how can we enable people to cultivate increased resilience, uh, to cultivate well-being? And what are the brain mechanisms that underlie this? And all of this work has led us inevitably to the conclusion, which is summarized in the title of this talk, that well-being is indeed a skill. And if we practice at it, we will actually get better. So one of the great influences in my life, uh, someone I met in 1992 who really helped shape the focus of our work on cultivating healthy qualities of mind uh, is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, this is the uh, picture that was taken in 2001 when he came to visit our laboratory uh, and he inspired much of the research that we are doing today uh, that is focused on the impact of healthy qualities of mind on the brain and the body. One of the things that has uh, really been uh, uh, seminal in this work is the changes in modern science which is enabling this work to go forward. And I'd like to name four specific themes in modern scientific research that is providing the framework and the background for uh, these uh, research activities to proceed. The first is neuroplasticity. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard this term before. Neuroplasticity simply refers to the brain's ability to change in response to experience and in response to training. <coughs> Excuse me. And more than any other organ in our body, the brain is built to change in response to experience. And this has given us uh, a framework and a conceptual model to understand how mental training that is part of the contemplative traditions, how that kind of training can shape the brain both functionally and structurally in ways that can support healthy qualities of mind. The second theme is something parallel to neuroplasticity, but in the realm of genomics. And this is the theme of epigenetics. And epigenetics simply refers to the idea that genes are regulated and that there are environmental factors, our demeanor, our emotional disposition, all impact the expression of our genes. And uh, I'll show you a snippet of recent research that we've published where we've been able to demonstrate 
when we bring long-term meditation practitioners into the laboratory that eight hours of intensive practice over the course of the day is sufficient to actually produce a measurable change in gene expression. And so the idea that genes are somehow fixed and deterministically unfold over the course of development is really giving way to a much more modern view that suggests that our genes are highly dynamic and can be influenced by our emotional factors and by training which we may uh, uh, engage in that can cultivate these healthy habits of mind. The third theme is something that really is absolutely central to the mission of Siron, which is the idea that there are these bi-directional highways between the brain and the body. Uh, and these pathways are the pathways through which the influences of our mind and brain can exert themselves on organ systems in the body and through which the body can impact the mind and the brain. We know from epidemiological research that people who display higher levels of well-being are actually healthier. The mechanisms through which those associations arise are not fully known, but we're beginning to understand something about the signaling between specific pathways in the brain and the body, which is enabling us to uh, uh, more specifically delineate these pathways and to uh, understand how changing the mind and the brain can influence the body in ways that can promote physical health. <coughs> and finally, the fourth theme is a theme which I'm particularly excited about, and my dear friend Mathieu Ricard later today, I'm sure, will talk about this theme in more detail. It's one where there is probably less evidence than the other three themes, but the evidence for this theme is growing. And the way I uh, call this theme is innate basic goodness. And here is the suggestion that we are all born, we come into the world with a specific propensity, a bias that prefers warm-hearted and altruistic encounters compared to encounters that are selfish and more aggressive. And since this theme is one where there is less scientific evidence, let me just show you how we can marshal evidence for this theme, and I'll show you two very short video clips. These are clips which are shown to 10-month-old infants. <laughs> Okay, that's the first clip. Okay, now which of these two clips do you think six-month-old infants would prefer? Six-month-old babies by far prefer the first clip compared to the second clip. Now, how can we ask a six-month-old infant which video clip it prefers? Well, there are many ways in which we can do this, quite objectively in the laboratory. And one of the ways we do this is by monitoring the eye movements of the baby using infrared eye tracking we can monitor precisely where the baby is looking. And what we find is, when this research is done, the babies look much more uh, uh, intensively for a longer duration at the first clip compared to the second clip, suggesting that they have an innate propensity, a bias that prefers cooperative or altruistic encounters compared to ones that are more selfish. So let me give you now uh, just a few examples of how we've begun to study the brain mechanisms that underlie these positive qualities of mind in the laboratory. 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama encouraged us to start with qualities like compassion. And in fact, when I first met him in 1992, he said to me, why can't we use the same neuroscientific tools that you and other scientists have been using to study depression and anxiety and fear, why can't we use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And uh, that's exactly what we have been doing. And so in the first uh, bit of work I'd like to share, we began to look at the voluntary cultivation of compassion in long-term meditation practitioners. And we did it in a very simple way. We had these practitioners alternate between a neutral state and a meditation state, each of these for very short periods of time, on the order of one or two minutes. Now, because these individuals were all extremely experienced practitioners, they, at least by their report, were able to do this even in the strange environment of our laboratory. Uh, and so that's what they did. They just alternated between the neutral state and the meditation state. Now, what was the meditation state that they were engaged in? And actually, one of the practitioners in this study was Mathieu Ricard, and in his own words, what he said they were doing is described here. Uh, what it says is that for the sake of the experiment, we're generating a state in which love and compassion permeate the whole mind with no other consideration, reasoning, or discursive thoughts. So by their own report, practitioners were able to do this. Most of us, when we try this, have some reasoning or discursive thoughts that intrude, but these were all very experienced practitioners with an average lifetime number of hours of practice of 34,000 hours. So you can go do the arithmetic at home, but 34,000 hours is quite a large number. So this is uh, an example of one of the practitioners. Some of you uh, who uh, are familiar with the meditation world may recognize this person. This is Mingyur Rinpoche, uh, and uh, he is set up to record the brain electrical signals during these meditation states. And what we observed in this first study is displayed in this figure. Uh, the first author is Antoine Lutz, who is a scientist who at that time was working in our laboratory. He is now in Lyon, France, um, pursuing the same kind of research. And what we see on the left of this figure is a resting neutral state. On the right is the meditation state. And you can see a visible difference in the brain electrical signal that differentiates between this neutral state and the meditation state. And what's being displayed are gamma oscillations. These are high frequency in the range of 40 cycles per second, very high amplitude signals. And in very recent research, we have found evidence of these signals even during deep sleep in long-term meditation practitioners. So this is something that is unusual, and it not only is present during the meditation period, but we see evidence of accentuated gamma oscillations during the period when they're not actively meditating as well, compared to age and gender match controls. <clears throat> this is Mathieu. I love to show this picture because uh, we took this picture after Mathieu had been in the scanner for more than three hours. Most people don't look like this when they come out. So when we put practitioners in the scanner and have them engage in these meditation practices, we see specific changes in different parts of the brain. And I here just illustrate one of those changes. And this is uh, circled in this axial image that you see. And the region of the brain that's circled is called the anterior insula. The insula is a very interesting part of the brain because it's the only part of the brain that has a um, topographical map of different visceral organs. So it literally is a part of the brain through which information about the body is conveyed to the remainder of the brain, 
and information from the brain can get sent to specific organ systems in the body. Uh, and so this is literally a pathway through which these mind-brain-body interactions arise. And what we see is when practitioners are generating compassion, the amplitude of the signal in this region of the anterior insula becomes elevated. Uh, it's um, more activated. <clears throat> so I want to move on now to talk about a couple of other phenomena that have been studied. One of them is attention. If there's one thing that has been strongly empirically supported in the modern neuroscientific research on attention, it is that attention, in fact, can be educated. This is one of my favorite quotes in psychology. It comes from the great American philosopher and psychologist William James, who in 1890 wrote a two-volume tome called The Principles of Psychology. And in that book, he has a whole chapter on attention. And he said in his chapter on attention this. He said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. No one is compo sui, a whole person, if he have it not. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence, but it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. And the italics are in the original William James. And so William James clearly understood how valuable educating attention would be. I think if he had more contact with the contemplative traditions, he would have instantaneously seen that these provide a vehicle for educating attention. And so we and other scientists have done uh, quite a bit of empirical research to evaluate the extent to which different parameters of attention can be affected by different kinds of meditation. And I'll give you one example. Before I do that, let me just show you how attention can go wrong. So these are data from children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And if you look at the curve that's circled, this is a histogram of response times. And what it displays is the histogram for kids with ADHD. And it shows that there is a very wide distribution of response times in a simple reaction time task. And the wide distribution of response times is caused by their minds wandering. It's caused by the fact that sometimes they notice the stimulus and at other times they do not because their minds are scattered. They're all over the place. Now contrast this distribution with the distribution from age match controls, which is circled in blue on the top. And that distribution is much more narrow. And that is because those children are more focused in their attention. And so we ask the question whether we can influence this very important parameter of attention, which is the variability in response times, which is one of the most critical signs of attention dysfunction. And we ask whether three months of intensive practice of mindfulness meditation can change this specific parameter of attention. And um, if you look at the curve, the, the bars on the right, this is displaying the standard deviation of response times. It's a measure of response time variability. Lower numbers mean better performance. Lower numbers mean more consistent responding, less mind wandering. And the um, on the left side of the, bar, the left bars are the practitioners who go through three months of intensive training in mindfulness. The first open bar is before they started the training, and then the second bar is after three months of training. And you can see in the practitioners that there's a decrease in the variability across the three months. Among novices who are just practicing 
for one week before the second testing occasion, they show no change in this parameter uh, of response time variability. So this indicates that three months of intensive practice is sufficient to produce a measurable change on this parameter of attention, which is so important for uh, attention deficit disorders. Uh, we also measured brain electrical signals, and we showed that there were a whole host of changes in brain activity which predicted this change in behavior. Um, those are detailed here. I won't go into those details. This is all published in the scientific literature. If people are interested, they can go to the publication. But suffice it to say that there were very uh, robust changes in the brain that were associated with the changes in behavior that we measured. Now, uh, one of the things that we've been really interested in, and this is the question that I mentioned at the very start of my talk, why is it that some people recover quickly from adversity and other people do not? We consider this to be essential to resilience. So we define resilience as the rapidity with which you recover from a negative event. And we've been interested in the extent to which different kinds of meditation may influence this process. And we can measure this very precisely in different systems in the brain. So we've asked whether different kinds of meditation can change this. So let me give you a concrete feel for this. Imagine uh, that at time point three, there's some adverse event occur that, that occurs, and this is a hypothetical time course of a response in one subject. And it could be a response in any biological system. You can uh, use different biological systems uh, and evaluate this across different systems. A second person is drawn in blue, and this person is drawn to show a more rapid recovery compared to the, the first individual. So the second individual, we would say, is more resilient compared to the second individual. So we've asked the question whether we can measure this in specific brain systems. The image that you see in the upper left is an image, a coronal image of the brain, and the areas that are functionally activated are the amygdala. And we can activate these areas by presenting uh, pictures that depict human suffering. And uh, what you see then is strong activation in the amygdala, and people differ in the rapidity with which they recover from uh, this um, uh, activation. And so we ask whether uh, specific kinds of meditation practice uh, influence the extent to which the amygdala reacts initially and the extent to which it recovers quickly or slowly. So on the left here, we see uh, uh, a group of meditation practitioners. These are not our very long-term practitioners. These are all people who are living in the West and who have a daily meditation practice of 10 years or more. Uh, and uh, we have the, the average number of lifetime hours of practice on the x-axis and on the y-axis uh, with the graph on the left is the reactivity of the amygdala. And we see no relation here. But when we look on the right, what we're plotting there is the relation between the magnitude of the amygdala signal during the recovery period. And this tells us how rapidly the amygdala is recovering following this negative challenge. And what we see is that among meditation practitioners with longer lifetime hours of practice, they are showing less amygdala signal during the recovery period, meaning that they're showing better recovery. Their amygdalas are becoming less activated more quickly over time. Now, among novice practitioners, or actually among non-meditators who've never meditated, they are displayed in blue there. And what you can see is something a little bit complicated, which is that only with many, many lifetime hours of practice do you get people below the mean of controls 
who have never been meditating before. And one explanation for this is it may be that people who are actually suffering quite a bit, who have a difficult time recovering from adversity, may be attracted to meditation in the first place in the, um, with the aspiration that meditation may help them to better adapt and recover from adversity. So this is a question which still needs to be <clears throat> unpacked in the scientific literature. I'm going to just skip this in the inf uh, interest of time. Let me just mention that uh, I, I mentioned earlier epigenetic changes. These are data from a study we published in 2014 looking at genes that are involved in inflammation. And what we show in red there are meditation practitioners over the course of just eight hours where we see a significant downregulation of genes involved in inflammation compared to um, non-practitioners in blue who come into the laboratory for a day of leisure where they're not doing any kind of practice. Okay, and I'm going to just end now by referring you to our website, <clears throat> investigatinghealthyminds.org. You can learn much more about our work uh, on our website. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about pain, but I don't have uh, time to do that. I'll leave that to my uh, dear friend, Mathieu, who was a participant in that study as well. Uh, and let me end with one of my favorite quotes that I think really captures uh, what uh, our aspiration is in this work. And this was something written in 1921 by the great scientist Albert Einstein, um, which doesn't seem to be showing, um, but I'll read it to you. Maybe. Let's see if that'll come up. Well, I'll just read it to you. Uh, there it is. Uh, Einstein said, a human being is part of a whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a prison for us restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the good news is that we were born good. Yes, we were. Yeah, that's uh, well. I think that was good news. And uh, so meditation is also very good. Um, you uh, have been researching that a lot. Um, we it gives us a better recovery. Only that, or are there other things to be mentioned as well? Uh, I think there are many other things to be mentioned as well. The better recovery is just one. Uh, of many components, uh, and part of it depends on different kinds of meditation practices. There are many different kinds of meditation practices. Mathieu will talk about meditation practices in more detail that involve cultivating care and compassion, and those practices uh, we have evidence to show, uh, and there's a growing scientific literature to show that it increases pro-social behavior, it increases uh, compassionate action, and so it's not just about recovery from stress, but it also will cultivate, uh, I think, uh, positive qualities of mind. Mm. You do it yourself? I do it myself, every day. Yeah, very good. <laughs> um, yeah, somebody asked, what inspired you to choose these four themes? Uh, the four themes... Well, was it something in your own life, or...? <coughs> 
Well, the four themes of, uh, that, that are, th these are the ones I named earlier, neuroplasticity, epigenetics, the bidirectional highways between the brain and the body, and innate basic goodness, are all themes in modern science which provide a foundation for this work to flourish. Uh, without these advances in modern science, it would be much more difficult to do this work because we wouldn't have a framework in which to do it, but now we do for the first time. Okay, thank you very much. I know you have to rush to yes, uh, so Schiphol sorry, now to, to catch your plane, but it was so fantastic to have you here. Thank you very much thank you very for much. sharing this with us.